really excited about today's show. Um, I'm up here in, in the extreme northeast of Maine in Lubeck on Boot Cove. And so you'll see maybe just a little bit of ocean view behind me. And what else? Real salt products, <laughs> Redmond products. And that's very apropos because today we have with us, I'm so excited, Daryl Bouchard from Redmond Real Salt. Um, Daryl, I really am excited. I've been very excited about talking with you because, well, two reasons. One is I love Redmond products to begin with. And two, salt is such a misunderstood nutrient um, that I was very eager to get into um, digging deep into why it's important and distinctions and all the questions that people have about salt. But first, tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll get rolling. Maureen, I am so happy to be on the program today. I love talking about salt. It's one of those things that's pretty interesting because people think, oh, salt is salt or salt's boring. And yet, as I hope your viewers and listeners can appreciate at the end of the show, I think salt is a fascinating topic for thousands of years. It sustained life. It was a source of trade. It was written about in every religious text. And yet people hear salt's bad for them. And so I yeah. hope we can dispel some of those myths. But um, I am in a little town in Utah. People think of salt and they think of Utah and they think of the Great Salt Lake. Mm -hmm. Little do most people know that about two hours south of the Great Salt Lake, there is an ancient seabed that my grandfather and his brother started mining in the 1950s. And so oh. this is an ancient seabed from Utah, and that's where I grew up, and that's why I know a little bit about salt. That's really interesting, and I didn't know that about you. This is the first time that I have um, talked with you. I normally uh, deal with Julie and Harvey, whom I, I love, um, and we've had Wendell uh, talk at one of our events. So I'm really excited that you're part of that family, that you go way back. Yeah. Yeah. So interesting. Um, my grandfather and his brother, they were farmers on this piece of property that their great grandfather had kind of homesteaded or farmed. And then in World War II, my grandfather ended up as a riveter and then a business manager at McDonnell Douglas in California. Oh. And his brother was a miner at the big copper mine in Utah called Kennecott. And so they had some mining and business experience. But after the war was over, these two brothers wanted to move back to the farm, the family farm, and wanted to raise their their families near each other, like a lot of family does. And so they wanted to spend time together and, and kind of work the ground that their great grandfather had. And then in the 1950s, there was a big drought and it was getting harder and harder to sustain the family. And so they were looking for ways to supplement income. And they thought, you know what, there's a little outcropping of salt just north of the farm and just south of the farm that the Native Americans had harvested long before the settlers had come through that area. So they knew there there was salt north and south of them. So they figured it was probably under the farm as well. And so yeah. in the 1950s, about 1958, during this drought, they went and got a loan and uh, bulldozed the alfalfa and the barley out of the way. And within about 30 feet of the surface hit this ancient seabed that geologists say was laid down, you know, eons ago during the Jurassic era. And so this old seabed that was under the farm be became what is real salt today. That's really neat. And um, what a story. Um, and you you touched on the the Indians possibly having had a salt trade there. I've read that salt, tr the salt trade is the oldest trade in the world. You read correct. In fact, the term salary is based on saline and wage because in the times of Rome, salt was as valuable as gold. In fact, mm -hmm. Roman soldiers were paid a salary or paid a wage in salt, there's an old saying that uh, you probably have heard, some of our younger generation may not have, but it's this saying, is a man worth his salt? Have mm -hmm. you heard that before? Oh, yes. But I, it's been a while. I'm glad you brought that up. 
Well, that is based on the idea that if you are paid a wage or a salary, saline, you're being paid a wage in salt. And if you're not working hard enough to earn your keep, you're not worth the salt that you're getting paid. You're too lazy. And so that that saying is based on this idea that you that used to were you were actually paid a wage in salt because you could trade it because before the invention of the refrigerator all of us would have had to have eaten more salt because we would have had to preserve you know kimchi sauerkraut all the veggies all the meats anything outside of season would have been preserved with salt this is why it was written about in every religious text. It was mm-hmm. used in in uh, ceremonies, in cleansing ceremonies. Um, the idea is salt that's lost its savor is good for nothing because salt was so essential for humanity, for animal health, for human health, that it uh, it was just such an important part of our lives. And all of us would have had more salt. But yet, you know, if we said, hey, raise your hand if you heard salt's bad, you know, my <laughs> you guess know. is... Almost everybody would raise their hand. Yeah. And what a shame. We do have this uh, this idea that salt is bad for us. We've been told, just as with fat, that salt is bad for us. It causes high blood pressure. It causes heart disease and all of these other things. Let's talk about why. what are your feelings about why is that wrong to begin with? Well, I think what's fascinating is even if somebody has high blood pressure, water retention, um, cardiovascular disease, any of these things that we have come to associate with salt, if you go to the hospital, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to give you an IV of saline solution, which is salt water. Yeah. In fact, an IV of anything but salt water would be uh, deadly. If you got an IV of distilled water, an IV of tap water, an IV of tea, an IV of anything but saline solution, the cells would start to rupture. So our bodies, you know, outside of a spiritual discussion, the only difference in you and I being alive one moment and and dead the next, outside of the spiritual discussion, is the absence of an electric current. You know, Mm -hmm. my hand moves because of an electric impulse. My mind, so if I don't conduct electricity, it's game over. And so when you go to the hospital, they're going to give you an IV to reestablish that electric current. So they'll give us an electrolyte, which is salt. And an IV is 0.9% salts, and then it's the rest water. And so if we have access to water and access to good, clean salt, in, in order of importance, we have oxygen, Mm-hmm. You know, that's the most important thing. If if oxygen disappeared out of the room, we're going to know in a hurry. And oh, then yeah. outside of oxygen, salt or sodium chloride specifically, there's a lot of different salts, but sodium chloride is the next most important element. And then water and then food would be a distant, you know, we can live a long time without food, um, a long time without water, but we'd live a very short time without salt or without oxygen. So oxygen and then salt, and then water, um, and then the other nutrients is what keeps us alive. That is really interesting. And um, just a thought, I've also read that purified sodium is needed for many chemical reactions in, in a factory setting. In the human body, we need sodium chloride, but we need the associated minerals that are part of the package that God gave us. Yeah. You know, um, in isolation, so sodium and chloride, um, and it's a beautiful part of creation because sodium by itself is a very um, explosive base. Uh, You know, you have acids and bases and sodium is, is in its pure refined form is a metal and it's a caustic base. And actually one drop of water, if it landed on one block of sodium, it blows up. It's extremely reactive. Chlorine is a very deadly acidic gas. Um, Chlorine by itself on the periodic table is Cl. 
Mm -hmm. The beauty of, of life is if you take one sodium, which is a base, very reactive, very explosive, you take one chloride or one chlorine, which is a very caustic acid, they bind together in an ionic bond and it becomes sodium chloride, which gives us life. Now, yeah. in the body, the body has this ability to break down through electrolysis, pull apart the chloride and the sodium in the body. Um, you can't you can't take pure sodium or it'd kill you. You can't take pure chlorine and it'd kill you. You can right. take sodium and chloride. The body breaks it apart, and the chloride is important for all kinds of cellular function as well as digestion. Our bodies use hydrochloric acid to digest food. Right. Our body makes that with the hydrogen from the water, the chloride from the salt. HCl, hydrochloric acid, and the sodium then is used to help regulate the intracellular and extracellular fluids through the sodium potassium pump. And so the, the human body is, it's amazing. And I love that, you know, the earth provides the humans, you know, provides us what we need and the ratios we need them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we as humans think we're going to make a better tomato. Yeah. Or we're going to make a better you know, salt, where if you go back to the, the way nature created it, um, you know, we are, are much better off going back to nature. Um, as yeah. a side note, uh, it's kind of fun. You know, our, our bodies are saline solution in motion. Um, in grade school, we learned that our bodies are about 72% water. And mm -hmm. so if I'm, if I'm 150 pounds, outside of a spiritual discussion, I'm really about 108 pounds of water and 42 pounds of mineral. Um, and really that's, that's all I am. But in this, our bodies are about 72% water. And if you look at the percentage of the earth that's covered in water, mm -hmm. it's about 72%. That is um, so cool. I didn't so know. Our that. body's water ratio is similar to the coverage of water on the earth. Wow. How cool is that? I had no idea about that. that that's, that's astounding. Absolutely astounding. Um, so in the body, salt as, as sodium chloride, when it's broken down, is necessary and at least partially responsible then for many metabolic processes and for our electrical. I, I like to think of the heart not as a pump, but as a power factory. And it requires salt. It, it, it keeps us alive. And that's why when you go to the hospital, even if you have high blood pressure, water retention, you know, cardiovascular disease, the only thing you're going to get is an IV of salt water. You're not going to give you an IV of tap water, an IV of distilled water. Those would all be deadly. Yeah. It has to be salt in the right form. And that's actually what keeps us alive. And salt's main job is to regulate our intracellular and extracellular fluids. And, yeah. and that's really important because processed salt is engineered to not do that. Yeah. So am I correct in understanding that on a cellular level, that salt is responsible for osmosis, basically, for keeping the cell wall, um, the cell walls need to be open they're porous. They need to be open to exchange nutrients and waste, nutrients and waste. But am I correct in understanding that if we have a diet high in purified, purified sodium, that the cell wall tightens, that the pores tighten yeah, and then so restrict that exchange? The ratio or the balance has to be right. Um, and that exchange happens through the sodium potassium pump is what it's it's what it's called and so there's yeah. a, a protocol that the cell uh, will actually open and close like this and it brings in the sodium releases potassium and so the balance of the of the sodium potassium ratio within the cell and without of the cell is really important and so if if you were to take a lot of of sodium um, and not have a lot of potassium, that's going to throw that out of balance. Just like if you have lots of water and very little salt, that it's going to be disastrous. It's called hyponatremia. And so if you drink a lot of, of distilled water, your tears are salt, your sweat is salt, your urine is salt. And so we're going to be flushing all of those electrolytes. And at some point, 
as that sodium level drops, hyponatremia, like hypothermia is right. low temperature, hyponatremia is low sodium. And so you will actually die and you'll see this sometimes in, in the military uh, camps. You'll have these young men that are running, they're sweating, they're drinking all of this water and yet one of them still will pass out and die from dehydration even though they're drinking a lot of water. So it's not the water that hydrates, it's water with the electrolytes that hydrates. Yeah. And having the right sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium mix is really important. And a lot of our ancestors, you know, they would have eaten a lot healthier than many of us do. Yeah. And by eating more nuts and more raw foods and more nutrient dense foods, they would have naturally been getting more natural potassium, magnesium, and calcium in their diet. And so if somebody is eating a lot of processed foods out of boxes, cans, jars, salt being a cheap preservative, they're going to be getting higher amounts of processed sodium chloride, and they're not going to be getting any of these nutrient-dense foods. You know, our, our ancestors and animals are really smart. You know, if we watch a horse, you know, they're going to have a salt lick and they're going to yeah. lick the salt, drink water, go eat part of a bark of a tree. They're going to go eat some grass, going to eat some dirt. And they're very intentional eaters. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think sometimes we as humans, because we have this abundance of food, you know, we think we're craving sugar. We might be really craving salt and mm -hmm. we think we're thirsty. And so instead of drinking water, we might go grab you know, a sugary drink, which isn't what the body needs. Right. And so that balance in the nutrition when it comes to salt and electrolytes is really important. Right. And that's why, um, that's why when we are working out or working, I think we should be working physically. <laughs> we need electrolytes in the water, not just pure water. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And we're seeing that more and more and, and doctors and the, and the science is catching up, you know, for a while there, just like you mentioned fat, people thought mm -hmm. that all fat was bad, right? It's not all fat. Yes, there are fats that are bad. And salt yeah. is the same way. It's not salt that's bad. It's the processed version. We can talk about there's two main things manufacturers do to salt that's, yeah. that's problematic, but then they put this processed salt on nutrient poor foods and then they wonder why we're having poor health outcomes and they blame the salt right. but it's really this processed salt on the processed foods with the lack of other good electrolytes that is what really the problem creates right and i remember uh, on one occasion i was in maryland on the farm of sally fallon morell on the the hottest day of the summer one of the hottest days on record and I knew that just drinking plain water was not going to be enough. So I was adding actually Redmond Real Salt to my water and it helped keep me going. However, I did eventually get sick. <laughs> but you know, what's, what's interesting is if we go to the hospital and they give us an IV, it's going to be salt water. Yeah. And, right. and they're going to charge us three, four, five hundred dollars for that one liter of salt water, where if we're staying up on it, and we're adding good, clean salt to our diet, which makes right. our food taste better. And when we're drinking high amounts of water, especially distilled water or filtered yeah. water, that we go out of our way to add even more salts back in. Because that yeah. there's nothing wrong with distilled water in and of itself or reverse osmosis. But natural spring water has other electrolytes and minerals in it. And mm -hmm. so we're not flushing as many salts. But if we're drinking distilled water or reverse osmosis water that is is depleted or void of any of those other salts, again, if if you drink distilled water, your tears are still salt, your sweat is still salt, your urine is still salt, because our bodies are saline solution in motion. And we use salt to purify the cells, to clean the cells, for the electric current in the cells. And so we have to always be replacing that salt. And the Florida Gators, you know, the football team, they notice this. And so they're out there, they're sweating, they're running, they're getting cramps, they're nauseous, their headaches, uh, low performance. And so they said, we need a product to aid the Florida Gators, this Gator aid. And right. so they created this product that was an idea was, hey, let's get some electrolytes with water. 
great idea. And then they add all this other chemicals and food coloring and sugars. And But the idea of an electrolyte to replace all of our lost salts, especially if we're running, biking, gardening, roofing, firefighters, military. I mean, everybody's salt needs are different. On a day that I go biking, I go through a lot more water and salt than a day that I'm sitting in a podcast room. And mm -hmm. I think as we listen to our bodies, we can get really good at knowing when we're thirsty, when we're salt deprived, when we're fat deprived, um, and not yeah. just always going for the sugary, you know, highly processed fats when we think we're hungry. Right. I remember even years ago when my husband was healing from Lyme disease and ulcerative colitis and all this other stuff, um, his adrenal glands don't function. And so his holistic doctor was having me fill veg caps with salt, with unrefined salt. He was taking something like six or eight a day. And I've actually been thinking about adding that back in. I think it might help him again. But it's because the body has a high requirement for salt. And uh, we can't function without it, obviously. But it's really confusing to know what kind of salt and aren't isn't salt salt and aren't they all the same so leading into that do you want to first talk about salt processing yeah so you know obviously i'm a little biased um, i think redmond is a great brand but there's other good brands out there and i'd like to we can end the discussion today with the i call them the three questions it's the yeah. three questions that you should ask to find a good clean salt, but I think it applies to any, you know, food, but there's really two things that go wrong when it comes to salt. The first is seawater, you know, the ocean there behind you, if you went and yeah. grabbed a, a big uh, pot of that and you put it on your stove, seawater occurs in nature about 3% salt. And so if you were to take, you know, four or five gallon bucket full of that salt water behind you and then boil that off, you're going to be left with a few ounces of salt in the bottom of that mm -hmm. pond. When you do that, you're going to get everything that's in the salt column, which, you know, iodine is rich in seawater, which is why mm -hmm. seafood and dulse and kelp and other sea based products have iodine in them. And so in that seawater, it's predominantly sodium and chloride. But you'll also get potassium chloride, magnesium chloride, calcium chloride, selenium, zinc, copper, phosphorus, iodine that's all occurring in that ocean water. Right. Well, salt manufacturers today, you know, if, if we went back a thousand years ago and went off the coast of Brittany, France or Hawaii or even there behind you, salt companies would have taken the seawater. They would have pulled it into a pond. Mm -hmm. And either evaporated it together in a in a vat, like we just explained, or they would have taken a clay-lined pond and they right. would have brought all the water in, this gray clay, when that salt settles off, it the, the salt becomes a light gray color. So the French gray salt right. comes it's from that sea salt. Yeah. Yep. A great brand. It comes from all of the, the, the minerals in the salt as well as that gray clay in the pond, like the Redmond clay. And yeah. it gives the color, that light gray color. And that's a great way to get salt. Well, around the turn of the century, salt companies realized that potassium chloride that occurs in the ocean and magnesium chloride that occurs in the ocean, those are valuable minerals. And so salt companies came up with a process where they could take the seawater, they could pull it into a pond with a different membrane or a different liner. They could leach off the potassium chloride. Then they can move the salt to the next pond and pull out the magnesium chloride, then the calcium mm -hmm. chloride, potassium chloride. So through a series of evaporation ponds, manufacturers today can take the seawater and leach off some of these other important electrolytes. This would be similar, you know, if you and I were, were dairy farmers and we had this, this great raw milk and we came up with the process that we could take all the fat off the milk and we could sell it to a, to a company for ice cream and for butter and for ghee and for, you know, whatever. And then we could sell the leftover skimmed milk as regular milk. Well, you and I have just doubled or tripled even our revenue because the nutrition is in the fat, not in the milk. Right. Absolutely. And if, 
you know, if we were a citrus farmer and we took oranges or a beautiful grapefruit, and then we found a process that we could extract all the vitamin C complex out of the grapefruit and then still sell it as a, as a fruit, you know, we're geniuses because now we can sell the vitamin C supplement over here and the fruit over here. And salt mm -hmm. companies started to do that. So they could take the potassium chloride, sell it to a vitamin company, take out the magnesium chloride, sell it to an industrial company. And so through a series of pawns, the nature of salt changed. So that's problem one. Okay. Yeah. Problem two is salt in nature is hygro, H-Y-G-R, hygroscopic. That means it sucks water out of the air. So if I have a salt crystal here um, and I have it... If you had it on your table there, it's probably humid because you're right by the coast. Yeah. This salt crystal will suck the water out of the air like a dehumidifier. And then you would have a pool of water under the salt crystal. I've seen that happen. And that's salt's job in the body, right? Is to help regulate and interact with moisture. The challenge mm -hmm. with that is if you put salt now in a shaker and there's humid, humid, humidity in the air, the salt is going to suck the water out of the air into the shaker. Yes. And now that the salt's going to get sticky. Yeah. So our grandmother would have put rice probably with the salt shaker, especially if I lived on the coast. Yeah. Just like you might put your cell phone in rice to suck that water out. Yeah. So salt companies got together, and this is around the turn of the century, and said, what chemicals could we coat or paint this crystal with to stop its ability to interact with moisture? Now, what's interesting, I, I see the look on your face, right? Because <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. thinking salt's job is to interact with moisture. And now mm -hmm. we're going to cover this crystal in something that stops its ability to interact with moisture. They came up with a whole list of chemicals, sodium ferrocyanide, cyanide, right? Yeah. Uh, one is sodium silicoaluminate, very similar to the aluminum in antiperspirant, which actually stops the way the body interacts with moisture. Mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and I tell people, you know, if you took two licks of an antiperspirant stick before breakfast, you're going to have some issues. <laughs> <laughs> That's I shudder at the thought. <laughs> but yet if you look at the ingredient label on a lot of salts today, yeah. There's this, there's a whole slew of ingredients, things like silico, uh, calcium silicoaluminate, which not nice, sodium ferrocyanide, not nice, tricalcium phosphate. And, and there's dozens of chemicals that salt companies can add. And in small enough amounts, it's, it's probably okay. But why would you want to take something that accumulates in the body every yeah. time you put salt on your salad? Especially because some of those compounds that you're talking about are difficult for the body to eliminate. And so they do build up. And maybe that has something to do with, for instance, aluminum in the brain and Alzheimer's. Aluminum is one that is known to have bioaccumulation. And so, yeah. you know, if, if you could have a salt that doesn't have sodium ferrocyanide or doesn't have sodium silicoaluminate, you know, why would we go to a salt that has been first demineralized? And mm -hmm. the demineralization is problematic, but I think the additives are worse because salt from the ocean was never meant to be a source of magnesium. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the salt that our bodies are based on are, are meant to get sodium and chloride. And that's all of our oceans today or these dead seas, like the Dead Sea in Israel, the Dead Sea in Utah, the Great Salt Lake. Salt. Yeah comes from a seabed at some point. So it's either a current ocean or an ancient seabed like the like the old seabed in <clears throat> here in Utah that the real salt comes from. There's an old seabed in the Himalayan and Nepal region that the Himalayan pink salt comes from. Yeah. There's an old seabed in South America um, that is uh, it's called the Bolivian pink or the Bolivian rose salt. Um, and geologists say this is kind of um, you know back in that early you know before the continents are all pulled apart, you know, mm -hmm. some would say around the global flood, you know, time yeah. frame. And so these ancient seabeds, we don't know a lot about them because it was, you know, long before we were here. Um, yeah. 
but we do know that they were mineral rich and they've been protected and, and hidden um, in the earth. And so it, they're not exposed to some of the issues we have, you know, with the BP oil spill, the Exxon okay. Valdez spill, the Japanese disaster. You know, one, one thing we humans have not been good at is being great stewards of the planet that we live on. And so yeah. one of the nice things about a, an ancient seabed is it doesn't have some of those, you know, microbeads and plastics and some of the, you know, pharmaceutical and chemical concerns in some of our current oceans today. That's really interesting, Daryl, because um, that is exactly why I, I switched from using Celtic sea salt to just real salt, because I'm concerned about what the salt might have absorbed, even in the North Atlantic Ocean in the north of France, because, of course, the ocean waters circulate throughout the entire globe. And so especially after Fukushima and a couple of other things. Um, I've been, I'm not going to name other brands, but I've been concerned. Yeah. And I, and I think it's a valid concern. You know, one of the nice things, you know, of all the, of all the other brands out there, if I wasn't using an ancient salt like ours, um, mm -hmm. I think Celtic is a great brand. I know Selena, she's a really nice lady. I think as all of the, of the, all of the current salt ocean water manufacturers, I think she is, my first choice. Yeah. Um, I, I do actually like the product a lot, yeah. but it's just that concern, that one concern about contaminants that has led me to, to stick with Redmond. I'm a little bit concerned about Himalayan wondering if there isn't some tampering going on because it's such a massive, um, Everybody, everybody knows about Himalayan pink salt. Well, I think that's a really maybe a good time to address those three questions that I kind of alluded to. Um, yeah. And I think these, you know, whether you're buying salt or you're buying whatever, I think these are good questions. And and the first question is who is producing it? Um, in salt, that gets really difficult because oftentimes salt will get commingled. And so you walk into the big box store um, and you buy a jar that says salt on it. Knowing who's the person that actually puts that in the shaker gets increasingly difficult. You know, it's not like going down to the farmer's market or going down to the orchard and, and buying a, you know, a, a bushel of apples because salt is commingled so often. But if you can know who's producing it, yeah. then you can find the answer to the second two questions. And so the second question is, and you alluded to this, is know the source. You know, yeah. if you can actually talk to the farmer and say, hey, you know, where did this basil come from? You know, where did this, uh, these eggs come from? You know, you can know, you can know the source with salt. That's going to be either an ancient seabed or a current ocean. And there are times, you know, if you were, if you knew the producer and you knew they were getting salt from the Gulf of Mexico during the BP spill, I would probably find a different source. And, and you know, water is the universal solvent. And so it didn't mm -hmm. take that long for Exxon Valdez up in Alaska to make its way all the way down through the South American coast. But there are certainly times like Japan, you mentioned that yeah. I would not want to source my salt from an ocean that's near, you know, between Japan and, and uh, California. And so right. if you know the, uh, know who's producing it, you know, the source, the third question is what are they doing to it? Are they yeah. taking anything out? Are they putting anything in? And I think if you can figure that out, whether you're buying steak or you're buying kale, you're buying salad, you're buying peaches, you're buying salt. If you can know who's producing it, know the source and know the process, you might find Redmond, which I think it's a great brand, or you might find another great brand like Celtic. I mean, there are good yeah. brands out there. And yeah. I think those three questions will help us be better consumers of whatever we're choosing to eat. Right. Um, I remember several years ago, too, that a friend, a Peruvian friend, brought me black salt from Peru. And that was pretty cool. Um, of course, it was a, a pound. I go through a lot of salt. I do a lot of fermenting, so I use a lot of salt in my fermenting. But um, um, I'm just fascinated with all of this, um, and I have been for a long time. Um, I am not afraid to use salt 
I even put a pinch of salt in ice cream when I'm making ice cream because it, it enhances the flavor. Salt brings flavor out in foods that you just can't get any other way. Um, but what about salt substitutes? I've never used one, but I know they're out there. Yeah, I I, <clears throat> great question. And I just saw on the chat, somebody's uh, asking about iodine. And we will get oh, to that yes. because notice would be complete without addressing iodine. But salt substitutes are interesting because people hear salt's bad. Mm -hmm. And they think, well, maybe a salt substitute's better. In fact, if you look at any label on a salt substitute, there's a warning that says, for normal, healthy people, this product should not be used without consulting your general practitioner before use. They add that on there because the additives that are in a salt substitute are so hard on the heart that people thinking that salt's bad, that they go to a salt substitute, which is actually worse. Mm -hmm. And so you'll never see that warning on any regular sodium and chloride based salt, but you will see that regulated on any salt substitute because the, the way that that salt substitute can throw off the potassium magnesium ratios yeah. in the body is extremely dangerous, which is why that warning is on every salt substitute. Yeah, that's interesting. And it makes sense to me because with our body's need at, 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 on, on a cellular level for every cell in our body, the requirement to have salt to function properly. I think about that with the heart and it being, um, a, like I said earlier, sort of an electrical factory, a generating station without salt, our, our heart can't function. And it has to be the right kind of salt. And that's where the salt substitute becomes a problem because right. in chemistry, a salt is an acid and a base that are bound together in an ionic bond. So magnesium chloride is a salt, potassium chloride is a salt, magnesium sulfate is a salt. In our bodies, we are sodium and chloride based. We need that the most. We also need small amounts, smaller amounts of calcium, potassium, magnesium in a lot of the salt substitutes, because people are worried about salt defined as sodium and chloride, they will add higher amounts of potassium chloride to the salt to offset the sodium and chloride. And potassium chloride, yes, it's important. Potassium itself is important. But in states that have, this is a, a dark twist, but in states that have lethal injection, the last injection in a series of lethal injections is potassium chloride because that's what stops the heart. They'll give a sedative, they'll give a muscle relaxer, and then they inject potassium chloride, which stops the heart. And so the reason that salt substitutes are a problematic and because the reason there's that warning is that pure potassium chloride that salt manufacturers or salt substitute manufacturers add to offset the sodium is actually more problematic than the sodium itself. Because as we Ooh. find in, in an abundance of water, you can't overdose on sodium. You can't overdose on an IV of saline solution because it's balancing the body. You can overdose on distilled water, you can overdose, but you don't overdose on saline solution. That's why when you rinse your eyes with saline, there's no burn. Yeah. If you rinse your eyes with distilled water, they'll get sticky and clam up because it's sucking all of the moisture out of your eye. Um, same thing with you a nasal rinse. You know, if you're rinsing your nasal cavity with a saline solution, there's no sensation. If you rinse the nasal cavity with distilled water, um, it's going to burn. Um, yeah. And same thing with an IV. An IV of distilled an IV of of uh, sodium a uh, 0.9% sodium chloride IV. It, there's no sensation. If you have an IV of potassium chloride and IV of distilled water, it would actually burn as it's going in because it's not what our bodies are based on. That's really interesting. Then, uh, and I, I used to use a neti pot and I would <laughs> rinse my nasal passages with saline solution. Um, why does salt help kill infections? Is it because it just cleanses? Uh, yes, uh, yes and no, both. Um, because salt is, because our bodies are salt water based, um, it's the perfect rinse. It's the perfect, you know, and I have a little bit of a head cold and I should probably uh, use a neti pot today. Um, 
But salt is also the perfect cleanser. This is why it was used religiously and why it's written about um, in purifying foods in the even in the Old Testament. Uh, the idea of yeah. kosher and, you know, what is clean salt was used to, to purify meats or to kosher them in the Torah. Yeah. So um, there's this saying is, uh, you know, go put salt in your wound and it um, meaning it, it's going to burn. But salt is also a cleanser. <laughs> And so our, the early militaries would put salt in the wound to sterilize and purify it before we had iodine and things like that that they would use. And if you've ever had a tooth extracted or a sore throat, your dentist or your doctor will tell you to gargle with salt water mm -hmm. because salt water is such a cleansing and purifying, which is why early cultures and our early histories, they would use salt for cleansing rituals, both in the body as well as in sacred sites, whether that was temples or homes, and they would use salt as a gift because of its cleansing properties. Yeah, and it's what what cleans my contact lenses at night. <laughs> Saline solution. So I want to get back to this iodine question because yeah. um, so people, uh, even like this listener, is asking about how do we get iodine if we don't use iodized salt. So interestingly enough, salt was never meant to be a source of iodine, and we never associated the two until World War I. And in World War I, they instituted the draft. And in the Midwest, it was called the goiter belt. And they noticed yeah. that this high percentage of men that were being drafted in the Midwest had a goiter problem, which is a thyroid issue based on iodine deficiency. And they, you know, think about why this would show up more in the Midwest than on the coast. It makes sense because on the coast, more seaweed, more fish, more fresh uh, sea products, which have naturally high sources of iodine. Yeah, yeah. Now think of this time as well. People are eating a lot of white sugar, refined flour out of cans. It's this, you know, healthy food is clean, processed, sterilized food idea. And so in the Midwest, we're not only starting to eat higher foods that are processed in general, but we're also starting to see uh, demineralized soil show up. And so the government said, look, we can't draft military if they have goiter, we can't bring this big, you know, thyroid deficiency. And so we need to solve this nutrient deficiency for the country so we can draft people healthily. Now, I would hope that one of these scientists said, let's have a campaign on the importance of eating foods that are naturally rich in iodine, kelp, dulse, uh, fish, um, and there's others, but those are the high ones. Right. What happened was they said, you know, let's find a, something that everybody has to eat to live. So it's either water. Um, now, in some municipalities, they will they will force uh, fluoride consumption through the water supply. That's yeah. a different topic for a different day. They yeah. tried that with iodine, but iodine is purple and it has a sharp taste. If you've ever tasted iodine, yeah. So if you put iodine in water, people aren't going to drink it. Um, and so that didn't work. And they said, what other product do you have to eat to live? They thought about adding iodine to flour because everybody was eating lots of refined flour. It didn't work very well. Um, and it turns the flour a weird color. I would say. And so <laughs> what they came up with was salt. They found a processed version of potassium or sorry, of iodine called potassium iodide that they could put in a stable form that wasn't purple, that they could add it to salt as knowing that everybody has to have salt to live. And so they wrote a law that said any salt manufacturer that does not add 45% of the daily recommended allowance of potassium iodide to the salt has to put a warning on the salt that says this salt does not supply iodide a necessary nutrient. So the reason that every natural salt has that warning is because of World War I when they instituted the draft and they needed to find a way to push iodine into the uh, U.S. population. Interestingly enough, the form of iodine that they add to salt is less than 10% bioavailable. Now, fortunately... Even though it's less than 10% bioavailable, there that means it's still there's 
there's you still get 10%. So of the 45%, yeah. you still get 10% of it. And if your question is, do I get zero iodine? And zero iodine is disastrous for the body, especially mm-hmm. in women. Iodine, low iodine levels, uh, hormones, reproductive health, um, sexual function, uh, uh, tumor growth, um, you know, breast, uh, thyroid, um, uh, prostate. All of these tumors are based on low iodine levels. And when they see those tumors, yeah. there's low levels of iodine That's and really energy levels. to understand, isn't it? And, and most people are iodine deficient uh, because they're not eating natural foods or seeking out foods rich in iodine. And so interestingly enough, natural salt, uh, whether it's coming from the coast of Brittany, France, or it's coming from the ocean behind you or this ancient seabed, it has about 10% of the daily recommended allowance of iodine in a quarter teaspoon. It's, it's not much. It's certainly not enough to keep us healthy, but there's a little bit there because it's coming from the ocean. Yeah. But even though this salt here has natural iodine in it, it has to say this salt does not supply it because it's not that 45% that's added. So The short version to, you know, a BC surfboards question is, yes, iodine is essential for life. I would say most people, especially women, are iodine deficient, and they probably should talk to their health coach, um, their their nutritionist, their doctor about getting their iodine levels checked. And if it is low, going and either getting a great iodine supplement like Iodrol or or Lugo's iodine solution. I've used that a lot. Or, or even, you know, going and, and sourcing dulse, you know, dulse is a type of seaweed that's purple. It's the highest of all the iodine in sea and seaweeds, but kelp's high, fish is high. Um, and, and if you can't get it enough in your diet, which many people may not be able to, cause they're not used to eating seaweed or seafood, mm-hmm. then seeking out a good source in iodine as a supplement, is going to be way better than a processed iodized salt that's one less than 10% bioavailable and it's going to be in a salt that is already demineralized with other chemicals added. And so if you came and said, you know, Daryl, you know, we're going to go live on the moon. Um, and we have, there's absolutely no way to get anything with any type of iodine other than iodized salt. I would say, you know what? Um, you know, there's always a trade-off and I would probably have iodized salt versus having zero chance of getting any iodine in my diet. But if I have any other source of iodine besides demineralized, highly processed iodized salt, that's less than 10% bioavailable. Yeah. There's a lot better sources for most people than iodized salt. Yeah. I'll, I'll say too, um, even in gardening, and farming and growing crops, but I'm an avid gar- gardener. So I understand too, that we need salt and iodine in our soils to grow good food. Um, here in Maine, this is not where I live, but I spend time here whenever I can. Um, I've done a lot in the gardens here and I go down, down the cove with a bucket or two and I collect seaweed and I bring it back up and put it on the beds because it provides salt, iodine, and nitrogen as well. And magnesium and potassium and calcium. Yeah. yeah. Everything that is needed. So I, I don't do that at my um, gardens in Virginia. Instead, I, I buy coast of Maine <laughs> compost. <laughs> and so I'm still yeah. getting the, the goodness from the sea here in Maine, and I'm taking it to Virginia. But um, even our, well, you were talking about the soils being depleted and that's a huge problem that people just don't understand. So I at least have that much understanding. So I've been doing the seaweed. Um, It's just something that I like to do here. And at home, I put seaweed compost and uh, Coast of Maine makes a a couple of different uh, composts, but they all contain salt and iodine. And then I have koi ponds at my house. And I put salt in those koi ponds, even though koi are freshwater fish, because they need salt. All life needs salt. So we use it. <laughs> you know, I think it's the, the ratio. It's so important to keep in mind because yeah. when, you know, we aren't, we're not saltwater fish, right? Um, right. 
but at the right form, our bodies need salt. And we, you know, people will say, well, you shouldn't drink seawater because, you know, our bodies and, and it's, it's true and incorrect at the same time, because if you were out in the ocean, it's not that seawater is going to kill you, but if you drink a lot of seawater, seawater is 3% salt, generally speaking, our bodies are 1%, generally speaking. Yeah. And so if we're drinking seawater, eventually we are becoming three times more salty than what our bodies are based on. And yeah. so it's not the seawater that's the problem. It's the seawater when it's not diluted to the right ratios. And it's not that salt's the problem. I mean, if I ate this whole thing in a sitting, yeah, I'm not going to be doing very well, <laughs> but it's not that the salt's the problem. It's the ratios and the balance. And I think that's yeah. the the beauty of life. You know, before we got on, we talked to a, a mutual friend, um, Willa at a little health food store yeah. in Pennsylvania. And, and I loved, um, she talked about being this intentional eater and, mm -hmm. you know, listening to your body. And I think oftentimes in our busy, hectic days, we sit at our desk or we forget to drink water because we're, we're too busy or boy, it's, it's eight o'clock. I'm going to go to bed soon. I don't want to drink now. Or I'm going to get up and have to pee at night. But I yeah. think if we get better about listening to our body's cravings, you know, the animals are so smart. It's fun watching, watching animals because, because they're more in tune sometimes than we are. Yeah. And I think as we get a little bit more intentional about, you know, when we're tired, we take a nap. When we're thirsty, we go to good, clean water. If, if I'm craving something, you know, rather than just going and eating a bag of potato chips or a big candy bar, you know, being, okay, what is it that my body's really hungry for? It might be salt. It might be fat. It might be water. Um, and I think we can get a little more intentional and it's something that I, you know, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm learning too, but I think, um, we could be a lot smarter and more intentional if we were a little more thoughtful. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I noticed too, you mentioned animals. Animals seem to be smart. They seem to want to eat what their bodies need. And we should be paying attention to our own bodies and what we need too. I put a pinch of salt in the dog water. And as long as I do that and I change the water every couple of days, the dog and the cat drink that water. But if I'm not home <laughs> and my kids are, are giving the water, they don't think to do that. And then the dog goes outside to find any puddle or bucket to drink from. So there That's must pretty be pretty interesting, right? Yeah, I've been noticing that. Um, I just thought sort of intuitively, we all need salt. The dog eats a lot of people food. I don't give him a lot of dog food, but a little bit more salt would be good for him. And so sure enough, I started to put just a pinch in his water bowl and he drinks it, whereas he doesn't otherwise. So there must be something to that. You know, I, I love that example. And I was just looking at uh, the Iowa Viking um, and Herbal Hermit saying, you know, adding some some uh, iodine to their, their, to their cart. Um, yeah. You know, what's fun is you actually can buy dulse powder as well. Um, mm -hmm. Dulse powder, it has, it's not a fishy taste, but it's certainly a seaweed, a light seaweed taste. But you can take uh, your salt shaker if you want it. One thing you can do if you wanted iodized salt is yeah. you actually can buy dulse powder or buy dulse oh, leaves, yeah. pulverize them into a powder. And if you add about uh, three or four percent, I have to double check the, the math. It's been a while since I did the calculation. But adding just three or four percent uh, dulse powder to your shaker of salt is going to give you more iodine than iodized salt. And it's going to be in a form that's plant-based that uh, your body's going to be able to utilize a lot more than the potassium iodide that's added to iodized salt. And it gives your salt a, a lovely pink color and yeah. a more red color, purple color. So just one more idea uh, for somebody that's let's... wanting to find a way to add iodine to their diet. What a great idea. So, uh, our friend Tambre, maybe you'll maybe you'll put that into practice. She said she ordered some dulce. Um, yeah, add that to the salt. I'd never considered that. I do often see seaweed seasoning, and I have some, but I hadn't thought about just adding the seaweed powder. That's really neat. Um, okay, looking to see who else is there. Um, 
this is this has just been fascinating, but I am <coughs> I am more convinced than ever of the necessity to have salt, real salt and real salt <laughs> in our diet. I, I don't go anywhere without my salt. I carry little salt shakers in my backpack, salt shaker in my purse. And when I'm traveling, I mean, I only brought three products with me this time. <laughs> you know, <laughs> salt is... Me a week. So I've got, I've got all the necessary salts that I use and love. Um, you know, good, clean salt is fun because, you know, a lot of the seasonings, if you went to the grocery store and look at the, the labels, because processed salt has a sharper, bitter flavor, a lot of, of seasoning companies that they're using processed salt, they will also add either flavor enhancers and or sugar to help sweeten and offset that bitter processed salt that's being added. And so when you're starting with a good, clean salt, you can yeah. take freeze-dried organic spices, add them to it, and the salt itself is naturally sweet, so you don't have to add any of the sugars or artificial flavor enhancers that you might if you were buying some other processed seasonings that are out there. Yeah. Well, I wonder, too, about how much is not on a label with some of those seasonings because of the grass generally recognized as safe. Um loophole that food processors utilize to hide a lot of ingredients that we wouldn't want in our food if we knew they were there. And so especially with seasonings, I'm really, uh, I'm really careful about that. Um, I only buy products that I know. <laughs> um, yeah. And I <laughs> then you can, you can ask those questions, right? Because there's yeah. a lot of loopholes on labeling that, uh, for, for many products that uh, you don't have to disclose what's in there if it's under a small enough percentage. But yeah, there's, I think, knowing who's producing it so you can ask a few of those questions are uh, pretty important. Yeah, super important. And, um, you know, grow your own, know your farmer, know your source and all of that. But it's it's really important. Monosodium glutamate is often called salt on a label. Or spice. Or, or <laughs> spice, yep. And natural seasoning doesn't mean that it's actually natural. It just means something is made to taste natural, but it's usually chemical. <laughs> so we're going to get into labels on a, on another, um, in another, well, sometime in the spring or winter, I imagine. But that's really important. But again, just to know your source. Now, this has been an absolutely fabulous conversation. I want to tell our listeners that we do have a link on our website, on our resource page to Redmond Real Salt and all of the wonderful products that you have, including electrolyte and clay seasonings and all of that. Um, many things that we're using in my home and in our in Aaron's home and my kids' homes as well. Um, and we have, I think we have a discount code. And I bet that Erin will toss that up there if she hears me say that right now. Um, I can never remember what those codes are. But at any rate, we do have a link. And we appreciate uh, those of you who want to give Redmond products a try. Please do utilize our link because it does help us. Um, uh, and we appreciate, we really appreciate Redmond as a whole, I have to say, because you guys have been super supportive of us and the work that we're trying to do. So we are very grateful for that. Um, but we're really grateful to you, Daryl. This has been enlightening even to me. I, I didn't know all of this and I thought I knew a lot about salt. Um, so it's been a great conversation, really informative and, um, Aaron says that the discount code for Redmond Real Salt products is GGT15 for 15% off. So there you go. Use our link, use that code, and uh, give the products a try. But uh, when I get back home, I have some Redmond salt to put on my garden. I've shared some with farmers for their livestock as well. And um, there's just so many different products that are all very useful. And, and now after this conversation, we can understand even more about why they're useful. 
Um, do you have any last words of wisdom, Daryl, that you'd like to share with us before we sign off? No, just I, just, I thank you, uh, Maureen. I've sure enjoyed the conversation today. And hopefully those that are listening have heard something that's new. Um, yeah, there's some great resources out there. One of my favorite books on salt is called Salt, A World History. It talks about the history of salt since the, the early yeah. um, use in Rome up through today. It's just a really fun book. But I uh, really appreciate you reaching out and I look forward to meeting you in person. Yeah, I'd love to be back on your show sometime. Events. Yeah, I will definitely invite you again. And and uh, I'd love to see you at our next event, April 19th through 21st in the tiny town of Wirtz, Virginia, when we have God's Good Table, God-Given Food as Medicine Conference. Redmond will be there <laughs> and maybe you'll come. Yeah, I'll see what the schedule is and uh, that would be fun. Yeah, I'd love that. And for those of you who are noticing the beautiful backdrop that where I'm sitting, um, God's Good Table, along with Sophie Ang from Sprinkle with Soil, are putting together a wonderful, luxurious retreat here in Lubeck, Maine, coming in, uh, I think it's the third week of June. So we'll be putting up information about that as well. And I know that we will have some Redmond products to share with our attendees Um who come to our retreat as well. And that is the salt. <laughs> I stock it. I stock it here in our friend's pantry, the, the owner of the home. So we'll keep on using it, but thank you so much, Daryl. And thank you to everyone who has listened. Please do like and subscribe and share. I know you hear all the YouTubers say that, but please do because it's very helpful to us and we'd really like to get this information out to as many people as possible. So with that, I am going to sign off and we will come back next week with another episode. So thank you everyone.